Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're going to talk about the Two Ocean Navy Act, because that is hugely important for the United States Navy and for the turnover from battleships to aircraft carriers. Today's video is sponsored by the Ryan family, not me, Ryan, in honor of their sire slash grandsire, Bill Ryan, who was a plank holder on USS New Jersey during World War II. Mr. Ryan is still with us, and we are excited to have him on board on May 23rd for the ship's 80th commissioning anniversary, along with his family. He will be joined by other uh, people representing the ship's three commissions, including Paul Stilwell, the award-winning author who served on board during the Vietnam War, Captain Douglas Katz, one of the two surviving commanding officers of the battleship who commanded in the 80s, and Captain Lewis Ivey, M.D., who was the first black officer stationed on the ship in the 1950s. We are excited to have them all on board on May 23rd for the ship's 80th commissioning anniversary, which will be open to the public. On June 17th, 1940, the exact same day that Paris fell to the Germans, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Harold Stark, went to Congress and asked for a massive increase in the size of the Navy. Just a couple of weeks earlier, another bill had been passed through Congress, increasing the size of the Navy slightly, as had one in 1938. But this new bill would increase the size of the Navy by about 70%. And so, it became known as the Two Ocean Navy Act. Prior to this time, the United States only operated a single battle line of ships, known as the Battle Force. They had a second force of ships, significantly weaker, called the Scouting Forces. But these two fleets were designed to operate together to scout for and then engage enemy battle fleets. Back during World War I, the United States had started to build towards having fleets in multiple oceans. However, going all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, the United States government, knowing that it had to protect both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, but knowing it probably wouldn't get enough ships to do both individually, dug the Panama Canal. At that time, the theories of leading naval persons, such as Alfred Thayer Mahan, called for the concentration of your entire battle force into one fleet that could wipe an enemy fleet off of the ocean. If you disperse your power, it can be destroyed in detail. But if you concentrate your power, you can destroy an enemy's fleet and therefore win a war. The United States has always been in a good tactical position having huge oceans between them and the colonial powers in Europe and uh, the other powers in Asia. So as long as the United States doesn't start a fight with Canada or Mexico, they really are protected from other major challengers. And so the Navy will form the first line of defense. Throughout its history, the United States has vacillated between isolationism and getting involved in alliances. With World War II already underway in Europe, while there was a large isolationist movement, the United States was relatively active on the world stage and had uh, some relatively well-developed alliance structures. However, over the first year of the war, watching both Japan heavily engaged in China and getting more aggressive towards the colonial possessions in the Pacific and seeing Germany absolutely blow through Europe. Like nobody thought that the German army could take out France in just a couple of weeks. That shocked everyone. And so it is no surprise that the U.S. is massively increasing spending in June of 1940 as uh, Germany is accomplishing the rapid takeover of France. France will capitulate very shortly after this. And so, 
the United States, which had been able to maintain a single fleet, which was mandated by the Washington and London Naval Treaties that had only just expired, uh, had been able to rely on Great Britain protecting the Atlantic, meaning that the American fleet could be largely concentrated in the Pacific. The alliance structure at that time uh, was not like it was in World War I when the United States was looking to build its first two ocean navy where Japan and Great Britain were allied. The, the United States was hoping to have an alliance against a single enemy in the event of war or have their own grand alliance fighting an Axis alliance. But in 1940, with France falling, the United States started to realize, oh man, well, we've got to figure out if Germany goes through France this quick, maybe they'll go through Great Britain that quick, and then there's nothing stopping the German and Italian navies from coming over here and projecting power in our hemisphere, which means that we need a navy that can protect the Atlantic coast in addition to the one in the Pacific. At this point, both uh, scouting force and battle force are in the Pacific uh, based off of the West Coast. Again, they can come through the Panama Canal fairly rapidly. The United States does a number of uh, war plans in the 1920s and 30s, which proves this and trains the fleet to do this. But they cannot simultaneously defeat the Axis fleets in both oceans with the current size of the fleet. Another lesson that the United States learns from this is we watch how heavily integrated air power is in the German Blitz. And so that is also going to play up in the Two Ocean Navy Act. So now that we've talked about all of that, what does the Two Ocean Navy Act actually call for? It is calling for eight Essex-class aircraft carriers, significantly larger than the preceding Yorktown class. Uh, these are able to carry up to about 100 aircraft each in wartime. Uh, they've got tremendous range. They're, they're probably the best aircraft carrier of World War II. If you ask 10 historians that, probably eight of them will, will agree that they're the, the best aircraft carrier of World War II. So, obviously, we don't know that its design is the best yet, but it is a great way of projecting power, and we'll come back to that later. Simultaneously, they're authorizing two more Iowa-class battleships. I believe that is supposed to be Missouri and Wisconsin. New Jersey and Iowa would have already been authorized and under construction by the time this bill is passed. Um, and it authorizes five Montana class battleships. So that is interesting. These uh, American super battleships are authorized by this bill, but none of them will be laid down or completed, and they will in fact be canceled within two years. It also authorizes six Alaska class large cruisers. Only two of these will be completed. Only three of these will be started. Three more will be canceled before they're even started. It authorizes four of the Baltimore-class cruisers, 13 Cleveland-class cruisers, and the second batch of four Atlanta-class cruisers. So we're authorizing all these aircraft carriers. Here we've authorized a large number of the ships that are going to need to escort them. Uh, not quite enough heavy cruisers there, and certainly not enough cruisers to escort the entire fleet of battleships and carriers that have just been announced, but a good chunk to add to what we already have. It also authorizes 115 destroyers, including the first 100 Fletcher-class destroyers, 43 submarines, 15,000 aircraft. 15,000. Those aircraft carriers need about 800. Let's say and even 1,000 if we count training squadrons to get pilots ready to go onto those aircraft carriers. So this is not just looking to outfit the aircraft carriers that are there, but also to massively outfit naval aviation. Worth pointing out that this is specifically naval spending. 
Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with creating new army divisions or new squadrons for the Army Air Force. These are specifically naval aircraft. It authorizes the acquisition of 100,000 tons of auxiliary shipping. So these are things like the repair ships, the supply ships, the oilers that are going to maintain these vessels. $50 million worth of patrol vessels. $150 million worth of new facilities. If we're going to be building new battleships and aircraft carriers and things like that, we've got to build new dry docks to maintain them. We've got to build new slipways to get them all built uh, because there is a timetable associated with this. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, we've got to build new manufacturers to make armor. There are only two or three uh, steel plants in the country that can make armor. And uh, to build a single battleship, you need 10 or 20,000 tons of it. There's also $35 million dedicated to the expansion of existing facilities. So there are already slipways and dry docks that can almost handle ships these size, but things like the Iowas, the Essexes, and the Montanas are drastically larger than anything came before them. The Montanas won't even fit through the Panama Canal. So expansion of things like that, uh, the Iowas can't be built in existing slipways because they're not designed for ships 45,000 tons. So it takes expansion of the existing stuff. $65 million of munitions. This is to buy the ammunition for these ships to use, which brings us out to a total of $8.55 billion in spending in 1940s dollars. And this is all going to be accomplished over a five or six year period. So the United States can see that things are going bad in Europe and is hedging its bets that it will get involved in this war sooner or later, or at the very least, wants to be able to project enough power to keep itself out of the war if things go very badly. And so they need this stuff right now. It's very telling that the ships on this list that are completed are the ones that come into service in 1943 and 1944 when the tide of the war is turning and the United States actually is able to project power on both fronts and fight the two major uh, campaigns starting a land invasion in Europe with at Normandy. We had some land invasions in Europe and uh, Italy already, but like the major one in Normandy and some of the major central Pacific island hopping engagements that eventually take us to Japan. So uh, the Passing this bill in 1940 is very timely. It is not ready by the time the United States enters the war, but enough of it is ready by the time the war is in its decisive phase. At the end of the day, it's a 70% increase, which is 257 ships, or roughly the total combat power of the United States today and 1,325,000 tons of new construction. Now, it's worth pointing out that uh, while this is a much celebrated thing nowadays, not necessarily back then. The New York Times thought that the timetable for all of this new construction was completely unattainable. In fact, they, they used the word problematical to describe uh, the five to six year timetable. I'm not even sure that is a word, but it's the New York Times, so it's, it's got to be right. Now, that said, remember I said uh, CNO in mid-June requests this? On July 19th, Congress goes to debate the bill. They spend one hour debating it, and then the House passes it 316 votes to zero. 316 votes to zero. When the United States declares war on Japan on December 8th, 1941, after they've attacked us, it is not a unanimous vote. But the authorization to increase the spending by over a billion dollars for military expenditure, just naval expenditure, not even the whole military, is a unanimous vote. That should tell you something about the mindset here in the United States as we're seeing Germany roll through Europe. That is incredible. Can you imagine Congress today passing something unanimously? 
Uh, and within a month later, on August 14th, the bill is uh, on President Roosevelt's desk and he signs it into law. At the end of the day, the New York Times was correct. The United States, even operating under a wartime footing in which it massively expanded the industrial base of the country to be able to build these ships, was unable to complete this. The five-year time period, again, takes you into 1945, 1946, uh, maybe 1947. The bill's passed in mid-40. Uh, and many of these ships are not completed. The United States, even with the new infrastructure that it builds, is not able to build the Montana-class battleships or three of the Alaska-class cruisers. Uh, although just about everything else on this list is built, uh, and there are a bunch of new Essex-class carriers substituted in there. But it is, it is interesting to look at this and, and say that, yeah, that there just weren't the slipways. Even with all this new construction, uh, that there was no way to build this in the time period necessary, which meant it didn't do us any good because uh, it wasn't going to be done during the war. That said, this bill is extremely important because it makes the United States the largest navy in the world. It makes the United States capable of protecting power in multiple theaters at a time. And it does, while it doesn't build all the ships called for, it does build enough ships to outbuild our enemies. And it builds the ships that will go on to win the war. The, the ships that are fighting in 1943, 1944, 1945, the ones that replace the ships lost at Pearl Harbor and in the uh, Solomon Islands and in the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, are all replaced by these ships, which are able to get to the front within about a year of their uh, of the ships they're replacing being sunk. And so they're there for the major campaigns where we uh, push the war into enemy territory and eventually win the war. It is also important, looking at this, based on the number of carriers. Uh, at this point, the United States has... Lexington, Saratoga, Ranger, Yorktown Enterprise, Hornet, Wasp. Uh, so they've got seven carriers, and we're authorizing another eight Essex-class carriers. That, that is doubling our carrier force. The, the United States is looking at the Blitzkrieg, and it's looking at the possibility of not having England as an ally anymore, which means that if the United States is going to fight World War II, we're going to have to fight our way across the Atlantic project power over mainland Europe, and then land forces there. To do that, you need ships to get there, and you need aircraft to project that power far over land. A battleship can project power about 20 miles over land. An aircraft carrier can project power, at this time, about 200 miles. So that is more than enough to support your forces to the point that they can get airfields ashore. So looking at the authorization of carriers and aircraft, the United States is very much looking at what if we have to fight this war alone? How are we going to liberate our allies overseas? And while Great Britain does not fall, as is feared, Roosevelt is able to do other things like Lend-Lease to prop up our allies. Uh, Hitler does the stupidest thing ever and invades the Soviet Union while he's already got a front open with Great Britain. Um, so that basically saves the Allies right there. And it means that we're able to start from Europe, uh, from England, as opposed to having to come all the way from the United States over there. But we do have to use these tactics in the vast expanses of the Pacific to take back all of the colonial possessions that Japan takes from the Allies earlier in the war, and then to fight our way through Japan's own colonial possessions to eventually blockade mainland Japan. I was not taught about the Two Ocean Navy Act in school, and yet it was hugely important for the United States, and probably more than any other uh, bill passed by Congress, it propels the United States to superpower status, being able to build all these ships, maintain all these ships, gives the United States the status that it has in the world today. And since these ships were built, the United States has had the largest navy on the planet.
Do you think I'm exaggerating or do you think it's as important as I say? Uh, do you think it should be taught in school? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, as well as a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. Again, we'd like to thank the Ryan family for their support on this video, and we are excited to see them and our other guests on May 23rd for the ship's 80th commissioning. If you would like to support the channel, there's a link in the description below. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us and the museum. Thanks for watching.